Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Maria Medina. I work as a data scientist at Microsoft on the consulting part um, here in Madrid. And I've been working uh, in data science consultancy for a little more than six years now in, in different places. And um, so it's amazing how things have evolved uh, lately and data scientists all over the world are making great models that are solving really complex problems. But I'm sorry, someone has to say this, we suck at putting models into production. Um, and this is, of course, a problem because life out there is not like Kegel. It doesn't matter if we have a model with 99% accuracy. If nobody is using it, then we're not providing any value. Um, but it's, it's fine. There's some things that we can do to, to help fix this. So I'm going to walk through some of our pain points and some things we can do to improve this and being able to put models into production uh, quicker or even at all. So one of the main things here is that um, in, in machine learning systems, the, the, there's a, a, the part of the code that is actually related to, to machine learning is very, very, very tiny. It's uh, the part of the code dedicated to uh, training models and uh, scoring uh, predictions is uh, very small compared to these other uh, parts we have about uh, handling data, creating features, uh, configuring things, deploying things, and so on. So if we are um, using notebooks, for example, to handle of the, all of this, it's very uh, likely that we're going to fail to uh, be able to build a strong, robust system. Um, but we also need notebooks at some points because data science is a science, right? And therefore, we spend a lot of time experimenting and trying out new things, trying uh, different um, ways of handling data, trying different models, different configurations. Uh, and we keep this in, like, in, a, in, in a iterative process. Um, starting from the business understanding part, moving on to the data acquisition and understanding part, doing a bit of analysis, and then starting with building the models. And we keep this an, as an iterative process. But eventually, we stop experimenting, and we should start building something more robust that we can eventually operationalize. Um, so from that perspective, data science processes, data science projects look like something like this, right? We have a big experimental phase where we try out many new things, and then we start developing something that is going to eventually come into, into production or in a, a deployment environment. And you might see now where I'm going because this is, looks similar to something uh, they talk about in traditional software development. Um, they have only the development and the operation parts, but Recently, they have come with uh, this new philosophy, which these two areas aren't disjoint anymore, but they work together, development and operations, to uh, make processes more efficient. And that practice is called DevOps, right? So the definition we like to use at Microsoft is this one. Um, so DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. And I like this definition a, a lot because it, it puts people on the top of it. So it's, uh, it's stressing out the importance of communication and collaboration between, uh, like inside the team and between teams to enable uh, this kind of efficiency. And we also uh, have processes there because there's probably a lot of things that are going to uh, need uh, ne that are going to to change for us to be able to implement these practices. And of course, there's also a lot of products and tools that can help us through this process. Um, so, in traditional software development, delivering something can mean building a product or a service that our end users are going to to use. But in machine learning. Um, delivering something it's, it actually means um, uh, having a, a model ready to, like for example, in a, in a web service, in an API that given input data, it's going to uh, issue predictions. And that's what we want to deliver with this uh, DevOps approach. So there is not um, like an official list of what 
its DevOp and, uh, DevOps and what it isn't. But uh, all the sources agree on some common points, that, uh, and I'm going to try to explain those points and relate them to um, from the uh, traditional software development world to the ma uh, machine learning world. Um, so the main difference between these two worlds is in software development they have like the code. Um, it's uh, every behavior of the system is ultimately coded into into the code. If you look at the at the code, you can see how the system is going to behave given a specific scenario at every time. But in machine learning, it's not only the code that determines the behavior of the system, right? It's also models and ultimately the data used to train those models that are going to define the behavior of our system. So we need to take into consideration these three, uh, three things and put them together into these uh, practices here. So we have to take into consideration data, models, and code, three things. Um, so the first practice is, of course, using version control. Uh, this is uh, having a way of tracking your code changes, so if everything, if something goes wrong, you can go back and fix it as quickly as possible. And in our case, we also, of course, need to track our, the changes in our models and in the data we're using to train those models. So we will need a, a version control system for modeling, uh, for models and data as well. The second practice is called continuous integration, which is um, the, the being able to automate uh, the process of from code, building, testing and building uh, your code so you have something ready to use. Um, and in machine learning, having something ready to use also means having a trained model that is able to issue predictions, right? So uh, our continuous integration practice is also going to include having, uh, having a model trained. So our, build, uh, uh, our building process is also going to include model training. Next, we have continuous delivery, uh, which is a practice in which from, from the code we previously built, we are able to uh, deploy it uh, in different environments, different staging environments, and ultimately going into uh, a production environment where that, co that uh, code or uh, system is going to be used by the end users. And in our case, this is very convenient because we can have multiple stages with uh, different models. For example, we want to try out and finally uh, automatically move the, the best, uh, the most uh, successful model into production. And so if we're going to build many different environments to try out our system, we need those environments to be uh, the same, right? We cannot um, risk to have some errors related to different packages, for example, being installed in different systems. So we need a way to replicate our environments uh, in a safe way. And we do that with infrastructure, infrastructure as code. Um, that is a practice in which you use code and configuration files to uh, automatically uh, build your systems and build all your environment just from deterministic code. So every time you build it again, you are sure that you are making exact copies of your environment. And that is uh, related to the use of microservices, because um, if you are going to build your system uh, very often and from scratch, it's much easier if you use uh, tiny pieces that uh, relate to each other instead of one big environment, and those are microservices. So microservices are those tiny pieces that have a sp very specific function and relate to each other and communicate with each of the other systems, uh, microservices, to create a whole environment. And that way it's much easier to, to deploy and automate things. And finally, it's very important to monitor all of these things because you, since you are uh, building all of these automatically, you need to have a way of quickly finding out if something is going wrong, you get a notification and you go uh, fix it as soon as possible. Um, so in software development, the only thing that, can, that you have to monitor and that can fail is your code, right? But in machine learning systems, we can have our system running properly from a development uh, point of view, like we have our model giving out numbers as uh, is expected, but those numbers might be wrong, right? Because the model might drop its performance, for example. So 
uh, we don't only need to monitor our code, of course, we also need to monitor our model performance and also the data we're giving because that data might change. As Casey was saying, this model, the, the world we're living in might change and our model is going to probably suffer from that and we will need to adapt to that. So now we know which practices are the best ones for uh, operationalizing uh, things in, in data science. Let's have a look at six uh, steps we can we can give to to get into to an MLOps adoption, and this is how we do it in in Microsoft. So um, let's imagine you have already uh, trained your model after the experimentation. You already have come up with with a good model that is performing well. And I don't know if this has happened to you as well, but it happened to me a lot of times. You have your model and you either forget to store it, for example, in a file, or you have you rerun all your code and suddenly your model has changed and it's not as good as it was before anymore and you have overrided it. And you need to start all over again and trying to see which things went wrong so you can replicate your model again. And that problem, we had it because we didn't have a, a version control system for our models. So the first thing, once you have a good model, is saving it so you don't lose it again. And for that, we use um, a tool called Azure Machine Learning, which is uh, a resource available in, in Azure to use for free. And it's, um, it's not only meant for, for saving our models, it's meant for much more things, and it's not replacing any of our machine learning code. For example, if we are using Python with scikit-learn, all that code is going to stay. And Azure Machine Learning is going to assist us through all the, um, the life cycle of our data science project. So, and this saving the model thing we're doing is like the second step in, in that diagram, but it's going to help us through all the steps and we're going to see it. So the way we, uh, we create this uh, with uh, Azure Machine Learning resource is by going to Azure portal, the, the cloud, and creating what is called a workspace, which is kind of a, a folder, a project we have for, for our um, system that is going to store all the assets and, and all the uh, yeah, processes that are related to our machine learning system. And we have two ways of interacting with that environment, with that workspace. Uh, we can either do it uh, by, by hand, clicking on the portal. Uh, they have what it's called a, a designer, which is a web-based tool with uh, dragging and dropping. You can build uh, a machine learning system for, for, from scratch without the needing to have uh, programming abilities. But since we want to automate this, we need to use code, of course, and that we have three ways of interacting, interacting with this workspace uh, through code. We can use the Azure command line interface, which is just a program you use on, on your console. And you also have Python and R packages with a lot of functions and functionalities to interact with the workspace. So if we want to save our model, we say we have our model file, we just give it a name, send it to um, the, our workspace through a function call, and then in our environment, we're in our workspace, we are going to have a list of all the models we have registered with the, na with the name, the version number, the date, uh, uh, the, the day we uploaded it, and so on. So all our models are stored in there, and we are not going to lose them anymore. But now, um, so you might have your model, and so simply having your model file and giving it to the software develop, uh, developer in, in your team, if you're lucky to have one, uh, it's not going to work, right? Because you need to know, you need to have some machine learning knowledge to, to be able to extract the, the predictions out from that model. So, Azure Machine Learning also helps you building a really simple web service, and that way you just have an API with an endpoint you can give to the software development team, so they integrate that endpoint with their uh, like bigger system. That is kind of a microservices approach, right? So the way of doing this is you just take the model ID uh, you got before for the model we, ju we have just registered in the previous step, we write a very simple scoring script saying like a few instructions saying from the, uh, you load your model, you do some data transformations and this is how you predict, which is normally calling the predicts function and that's it. 
And you may have some dependencies in your code. You can in your code you can also specify those, and then you choose what they call a, a compute target, which is where in in the world is this web service going to be deployed? It can be locally in your machine. So in that case, Azure Machine Learning gives you the the Docker image, so you can put uh, so you can deploy it anywhere you like, or you can use. Azure's uh, container services, which is Azure container instances for like for the simple lightweight uh, containers, but you can also use Kubernetes service if you need something more robust. And that is easy. You just make the, the function call and you get your running your web service running with an endpoint you can call and give the data and the model will return you the predictions. Um, and then you have a list, if you go to the, your workspace, you can also uh, make uh, function calls and get this data like uh, programmatically. But if you go to the uh, uh, Azure portal, you can see the list of all the deployments you have um, active and running or even uh, stopped. Uh, and if you click there, you can go back uh, to the model is actually being used in this service that you have just deployed. So now we have our model up and running. Um, we might want to monitor it, right, to make sure that everything's going fine and it's still working properly. So the way we have for doing this is an integration with another microservice called Application Insights inside the uh, Azure portal. And this is the service that is in charge of monitoring every app inside Azure. So it's very easy integration. You just have to click like uh, some configurations. And you can activate uh, web service logs. So you have a log of everything that is happening inside your web service. But you also have two very cool things related to model and data. You, have, uh, you can track all the data that is uh, coming through your, to your web service and the predictions you are issuing. So you can check if your performance if the performance of your model is dropping and you also can have uh, notifications if the data you're receiving differs too much too much from the data you use to train your model uh, back when you train it so and you will get an alert and you will be able to go see what is happening and maybe retrain your model if you need to so in the case you, have, you want to retrain your model, you might want to uh, try out new, uh, a whole lot, uh, lot uh, of, of new um, algorithms, uh, parameters, maybe even create new features. And so since we're doing this with an MLOps approach, and we have already experimented back uh, when we built the first model, we know now more or less the things that are going to probably work out and the things that are not. So we can start building something more robust so we can easily automate this. And the way we have for doing this with Azure Machine Learning is you take, so you can have the data set download uh, directly from your code, but it's it's uh, a big data set. It's more likely that you're going to upload it to the cloud and use it from there. So you just uh, specify the connection. Hey, I'm going to use this data set located over here in any um, storage option you want. You build uh, a training script, a training file with all the steps you are going to give for uh, for the training. You do uh, so everything you were doing before, such as I don't know, uh, train test, uh, splitting the data, or proving, uh, trying out many different options, models, and so on. You're still going to do that with the framework you prefer. Um, you're going to specify the dependencies, and you're going to specify the compute target, which in this case can also be your local machine, or also uh, maybe a, um, a virtual machine with CPUs or GPUs if you're using, uh, if you're doing leap learning or Databricks if you're using a Spark or many other options. And Azure Machine Learning is going to package everything together, send it to, for example, the virtual machine. It's going to start the virtual machine, send everything there, build like a, an image for, to be executed there, and store all the results that you're getting in your training process. And then when the training is finished, it's going to store everything, shut down the machine, and uh, end happily. So you are only using the compute you need, and on the only times you are training, it's uh, automatically being started and, uh, and turned off when you're not uh, using it again. 
And then in the workspace, what you get is a summary of all the train, uh, all, 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 the, all the experiments you get, uh, every uh, interaction, everything you try with, the, uh, with a new model is called an experiment. And then th there you have all the metrics you, um, you store, like, I don't know, your accuracy and the time, the time it took to train the model and everything. You have it there, and you can take the best performing model from all the, the log you have here of all the experiments you have made. So you take the best experiment, that's the model you might want to put into production eventually, and you register it as we were doing before. So before we took our model file we had in our computer and registered it, and that's like um, having a list of favorite models that are likely to be end up in, in a productive environment. Um, and in here, what we are doing is, OK, I'm not giving you a file, because I've already trained everything in the system. So go take that experiment, with what's, uh, which was the best one, and take the model you had there and save it as a favorite to be used uh, further on. And in here, what we have is, this is the same list that we had uh, from the beginning. But now we have uh, that parameter there, which is called the run ID that tracks back to the experiment we had, and the experiment tracks back to the code we used to train the model and the data we used to train the model. So from that, this model here, we can go back to the, even the data we used to train it, and we can go further to every place this model is deployed into. So now we have the end-to-end -end traceability of our whole machine learning system from the data we used to train the model to the endpoint where that model is working in our system. And now we have that end-to-end -end process. Now it's time to automate everything using continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines. And for that, we are using um, Azure DevOps, that's the tool we use inside Microsoft, but you can use any other end-to-end uh, -end, um, software building uh, tool you want. And in here we have, so in here we have the repositories, but you can integrate that with GitHub, for example, if you want to. We have the pipelines, we have uh, task force, but you could also use, I don't know, Jira if you like, or uh, Jenkins, or any other tool for automating things you, you, want, uh, you might want to use, and integrate all the pieces you want if you like uh, different uh, tools for different things. And what we're doing here is, so we're having our, uh, our code repository. We normally uh, are uh, trying to do a, a trunk-based uh, philosophy where everything uh, tries to be on, on the master uh, branch. And if we do some changes, we try to keep them uh, as, as short and as small as possible to, to prevent uh, having like uh, a mess when we try to merge brands together. So, we set up a trigger in the, man in the master branch, and every time something changes in that master branch, we can uh, trigger a, a, release, a build pipeline sorry, um, that is going to perform every step we configure here. So this is totally customizable, and we have selected which steps we want to take each time our code changes in our repository. So the steps we are taking here is first, uh, whenever something changes in our code, we're going to launch a training with Azure Machine Learning. We're going to take that code, which also has uh, all the variables we're going to use, the configuration for the models we want to try, and everything else. And we're going to launch a training. And those experiments are going to uh, begin to run. And when all of them are finished, the pipeline is going to move on to the next step. And the next step for us is going to be having some uh, command line script configured there to get the best experiment we got. And that e experiment that was uh, successful, we're going to register it as our favorite model. Um, and Azure Machine Learning is, is going to package it, and we're going to um, publish it into this pipeline as an artifact we're going to use later. So that is the result of our build pipeline is the model we are going to use eventually in, in a productive environment. And this is uh, how it looks like when you execute this. So you get, um, 
you can have many jobs if you want to do things in parallel, but uh, this is like a simple thing. We are only go doing one, uh, like one line, and we have every step we had configured in our pipeline, and we get the green check marks is if everything goes right. If something goes wrong, we get a, a cross, a red uh, cross, and the pipeline stops there uh, and don't continue uh, to the next pro uh, step. So, for example, if the model training fails, then we don't register any model because the previous step has failed. And now we have our release pipeline, which is the continuous deployment uh, yeah, practice, and we can set a trigger when and when an artifact changes. So in this case, when our model artifact changes, which means when we have a new model train, we are going to release, um, we are going to trigger the release pipeline, which is going to um, deploy that model into different uh, environments. We we can configure this. this. We, for example, may want to create uh, first uh, deploy the model first in a development environment, and then move on very uh, following stages until we get to production environment. And we can even put a manual approval uh, process in, in between, so we make sure that somebody is checking this before changing the model into the into the productive environment. If we want to have some business decisions involved there or anything. And this is how it looks like. So if we have um, everything has gone right, then we have all our uh, environments, one after the other. And if we click on one of them, we see all the steps that we're performing and everything green in ev if everything has gone right. So now we have both of our uh, continuous uh, integration and deployment pipelines in place. So we have automated everything. But there's one thing missing, very important thing here. So I didn't mention it uh, yet to, like, to simplify the process, but of course, if you're doing all of this automatically, you need to have tests everywhere to make sure nothing is going wrong and you're not propagating something wrong until the very last stage of your deployment. Um, the problem with testing in machine learning systems is, is uh, that it's very complex and difficult. Uh, so in here, you can see the difference uh, between a traditional system and software development system in which we have only uh, unit testing, integration tests, uh, monitoring. But in machine learning systems, again, we have data to test, models to test, and codes to te uh, code to test. So we have many different tests we, we, need to, we need to take into account. This is a very good paper that has a battery of uh, 50 tests or so, so, so you can have a checklist of everything you need to test. Um, but I'm going to sum up with some examples of things you, you want, might want to, to try. Uh, so for example, before, Launching the training. Um, so imagine you, uh, yeah, you make a co uh, change in your code, and that triggers a training pipeline. And you start a machine with GPUs, and you have it running for eight hours. And when you finish, you realize that the data was wrong, and that's of course a waste of time and resources, right? So we, you want to make sure all your data is fine before you actually start doing anything and consuming resources. Um, so in this step, you might want to check things as um, features, how are they built, if the uh, distributions are fine, if everything looks more or less correct before you move on to the modeling phase. And then, before registering the model, you might want to, want to check the model you have created uh, to see if it's actually uh, doing better than the model you currently have into pr in production, for example, or to check that it's not biased or is good in any way. You might want to have different tests here, here to, to check that your model is actually good. And then, every time you deploy a new environment, you need to have a lot of uh, tests, uh, integration tests, to check that everything is working fine and maybe have uh, different uh, difficult examples to make sure that uh, everything is behaving properly before you move on to the next stage. And if any of these uh, tests fails, then the pipeline is going to stop and you are not going to, or this, the tool is not going to move forward to the next step. And this uh, uh, Azure DevOps has integration with many of the uh, testing frameworks out there. So you can have uh, a tests uh, tab here inside the tool where you have like all the 
tests you have run and uh, the processes that has have gone right and the ones that haven't, and you can see the log of everything that has happened inside your system. And with that, we already have an, uh, yeah, an MLOps system that is automatically running and uh, yeah, efficiency automating most of the, mach uh, the machine learning and data science project stacks. This is uh, something that looks like this. And since I work in, in consultants, uh, we try to do this in, in every project we have, but it, of course that depends on the maturity level of the customer and the project. So we try to do this step by step uh, try not to rush anything because it's uh, easier to start deploying a model and then start with the experimentation phase and then start and then follow with the uh, CI/CD pipeline. So it's better to to have everything done step by step until you reach this whole uh, big uh, architecture up and running. Uh, but I think uh, we have it. Uh, so in in our area, I think it might be easier than than DevOps in in software development systems, because this is a quite new area, uh, meaning that we don't have that many systems that have been running for 10 or 20 or 20 years. So we don't have that much legacy. It's easier to change, and uh, also there are some teams that are even build, uh, being built now. So uh, we're uh, like a very young area where it's easier to change the culture and implement something like this uh, easily and, and in an efficient way. Uh, and with that, I, I conclude. It's only if you want to know more about the business uh, perspective of this, you can take the talk by my colleagues Pablo and, and Carlos tomorrow. And also, if you want to know more on the data side, you can check the, the talk about uh, automating data quality, which is also going to be tomorrow by my colleague Aitor. Thank you. Do you have any question? I have set here some resources you might want to check. Great, thank you then. <laughs>